I enjoy always coming and, and sharing some of our research and just reinforcing the idea of exercise and medicine. So I have um, been working in stroke recovery for a number of years. Uh, I work at Katie Medical Center. Uh, we are, I'm really excited because we're starting to be a part of more national recovery trials. So people, we're actually trying to get people when they come into the hospital and to deliver some really uh, intensive therapies and treatment options, some devices that might help with stroke recovery. So it's a really exciting time in Kansas City. Uh, we're right up there with the big Super Bowl win, right? Yeah. Anyway. I am really excited about it, but exercise for secondary stroke prevention has been something, and for primary stroke, stroke prevention, is something I've been very passionate about using exercise as a way to improve blood pressure, brain health, and so I'm going to share some uh, a lecture that uh, I'm always excited to deliver. So I always love to start with this um, slide because I think it's so important to think about, and I know a lot of us go to physicians and we get uh, medication for, for our, our blood pressure, what have you. But honestly, every almost every physician will agree, every health, you know, large health care organization will agree that if we can just take everything that exercise does, all the benefits of it, and put it into some pill, that it would be the most prescribed medication. There are people at KU that are trying to target drugs. One of them is called aerobics. I think, and so they're trying to target certain pathways in which exercise is beneficial, but nothing will ever take the place of being active and moving. So for those people that are chosen not to come in or upstairs doing their exercise, they're, they're making a good choice for being active. But I think it's just important to know how important that physical activity is. And you know, for, for people with stroke, there was this, um, trial that took all of the, the drug trials and all of the exercise trials where they looked at prescribing. And the outcome measure was mortality, so death. And you know, they looked at, you know, what were they taking and what prevented death in this large group of, of trials. And what they found was that exercise was more effective for treatment after stroke. If, if, if they engage in physical activity, it was better than the antiplatelets, which means, you know, trying to keep your blood from being sticky and anticoagulants, which if you're on a blood thinner, trying to um, uh, keep uh, your blood thin was more effective. Um, but exercise should be considered, um, you know, something that is alongside the drug therapy. So we're not saying that you need to come off your medications or stop taking them, but just the importance of exercise and improving outcomes after stroke is really important. And, and especially, you know, again, your blood pressure medication is probably one of the best things you can do for your brain health and heart health. Any questions on that? All right. So there's been a lot of ways because exercise after stroke is not always easy um, to do. And I'll be really honest, we really don't know the best medicine or best, best exercise and the best exercise prescription for that. You know, we typically tell people to be physically active on most days and we follow the um, guidelines for um, older adults and, and looking at reaching 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous. And so, again, we're trying to think of creative ways, you know, to, to get people to exercise because, you know, it, it can be a challenge and, and having physicians. Virginia tried this, um, uh, no, it was Vermont. They uh, were, were very interested in having physicians uh, give an exercise prescription to patients when they came in for an annual visit. And so thinking about ways in which we can be creative in that delivery. And I've been a real advocate of the physical therapy profession and trying to have an annual wellness checkup with the physical therapist, or at the very least when you leave the hospital or your outpatient therapy that the therapists are taking the time to talk about it because there's a lot, you know, that I think after you have a stroke, um, you don't know. So um, I was really privileged to uh, put together a team of um, research scientists, clinicians, physicians, therapists, nursing staff, OT, to be on 
um, and to come up with the physical activity and exercise recommendations for stroke. And we really, again, just don't have a lot of literature. They need to be updated. We did this in 2014, but I just want to give you a historical perspective on exercise. So when I started my career and in this journey of exercise after stroke in the late 90s, it was thought that exercise was bad for people after the stroke. It was thought that it would make people worse or that their symptoms could get worse. Um, but back then we also thought the brain was plastic, so, or not plastic. So we've learned a lot over time, right? We've learned that the brain heals. We learned that the brain can um, kind of remodel itself to, to learn new ways of doing things. Um, but we also know because a lot of people with stroke have cardiovascular risk factors, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, um, uh, glucose, and things like that, that um, exercise really is beneficial. And so if you think about this, we really started in the early 2000s, starting to make our way into talking about exercise post-stroke. So we're a really small you know, part of, of, um, of, of time in thinking about how to improve exercise. So we really have tried to address, like we think about exercise as medicine, how often should we tell people after stroke to take their exercise medicine? How much of it should be prescribed? How many days per week? What type of medicine? Uh, and thinking about the FIT principle, which is frequency. So again, how often? Uh, intensity, which is the I, and so how much? And then time, how many times per day? And then what type? is the last T in this, in this FIT principle. Should you do aerobics? Should you do resistance training? What type of device should, it, should you be doing? Is walking okay? If you can't walk, should people be using a stepper or some other device? And so uh, again, we're trying to figure out what is the best uh, prescription for people post-stroke. So what we do know again, it, it, and this is really not uh, anything new. Again, I think now activity on most days per week, like I said, to be active and, and move around. I often think about my grandparents, they never exercised, but they were farmers. <laughs> and so every day they were just doing the activity on the farm or you know, they'd do their job, which was active, but they were on the go all the time and were very, very healthy and, until they, they died. In the really weren't on any medication. So again, I think if we can reduce the time that we're sitting, uh, so I think they will feel free to stand up and you know mark in place, I'm all good with that here. Um, but to be active on most days of the week, but at a minimum, really thinking about those three to five days a week, if you can really get in some good minutes for exercise, that is good. Um, intensity, I would say, you know, we have up here guidelines, 40 to 75% of BO2 peak, but I would say, you know, of your heart rate, if you can get that heart rate up um, into an intensity, we're going to talk about how you can monitor it. So we really try, as clinicians, I and as uh, researchers, we really try to prescribe exercise in a heart rate zone, which is about 40 to 60, 65% of your heart rate reserve. Um, to try to get people in that zone, but not everybody can calculate it. And so we'll talk about a way that you can monitor yourself. We've also found that there's benefit in doing short durations. Like if you, if you can't do 20 to 60 minutes of exercise, and not everybody has 60 minutes in their day to really focus on exercise, but you can break it up into shorter bouts throughout the day and that there's still some benefit for there of, of that. So just kind of keep that in mind. And then the, the type of exercise, we'll talk about that, whether it's aerobic, resistance, um, things like that. So, you know, I think the intensity is always the how much and it depends on what your goals are, right? So if you really want to just improve your overall health and well-being, being very active is important. Moving around and sitting less. We see big differences in people's overall health. If your goal is to really reduce your blood pressure, try to manage diabetes, you have to exercise a little bit harder. And that is getting into those moderate intensity exercise. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that. So if now, if you want to, you can go online. There's heart rate calculators all over the internet. And that's one of the nice things about the internet. You don't have to write anything down. You just Google it. And so um, to think about this, you can, you know, go in there and say, go in there and take 220 minus your age. And if you say, I want to work at 65% of my heart rate max, you can just take 220 minus your age 
and then times it by 0.65, and it'll tell you a target heart rate to reach. Um, if you're on blood pressure medication, um, you can use this equation. So that will uh, uh, that's one equation that you can use. And then you just have to be, if you have a really high resting heart rate, so if your heart rate sits at about 80, 85, 90 beats per minute, I really recommend this one that's called the carbonin uh, formula. You can Google that as well. And it takes into account your resting heart rate. So a lot of times when people are in the hospital and you know they're not feeling well, you know, sometimes their heart rate goes up. And so sometimes just getting people standing, they reach their threshold of what their heart rate is. So we use this reserve to give us a little more wiggle room to try to do um, exercise. So just think about that. Um, but also know that if you're on a beta blocker or you know that kind of keeps your heart rate lower you might not reach those targets because the medication is doing its job. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can monitor that. So if you've never heard of a, when you guys come and do your exercise here, do you use a scale or rate of perceived exertion or anything? Do you guys use anything like that? No, okay. So there, there's a scale that we can use and I like to keep, um, uh, people, you know, right in this 12 or 13, um, and I'll show you what this scale looks like here. So again, six, six is thought to correspond, so you just take this times 10, six is thought to correspond to like, you know, I'm hardly doing anything, maybe it's standing up or walking to, you know, get something out of the refrigerator, you're just not working very, very hard. Um, so it's little to no effort. In this green zone, this is where I like to see people get. Um, it's somewhat hard. Um, this is when you're doing exercise, you should be in this green zone. And then if you're in this red zone, this is kind of you know where it's like very hard. And so sometimes for people, uh, you know, me, if I have to, if I decide to take the stairs and I'm in, in a hurry and I have to run up them, I probably, you know, teetering on this. I'm usually short of breath. I'm not a, a, a short, high horse person. But again, it's very hard. And so if you want to get into those vigorous int intensities a little bit, we can have you get here. But if you're like, you know, I don't want to think about the scale. I just want to know something really easy. We call it the talk test. So if you're doing activity, like if I were to move around and walk, so I can walk and talk at the same time here. So I, or, you know, I could, um, uh, this is what we would call this light. So it would be in this cell. So I can walk and I can talk and I don't feel short of breath. I can hold a conversation. Um, that's where we would be for this. Um, when we think about this moderate zone here, um, you know, again, you can you can talk, but you might feel a little short of breath, like if you were to carry a tune and sing. You know, like, if, and I can't sing anyways, it's not good. I'm not going to give any examples here of what that would look like. But, it, you know, think about, you know, if you were going fast enough and you're, you know, needed to take a pause because you need to catch your breath, um, that would be in that moderate intensity. And if you're doing your exercise and it's so hard that you just like, can't, you know, really take a, give a sentence or sing, then you're probably in that high intensity. So it's just, a way for you to monitor yourself where you are and kind of keep um, keep that in mind. Any questions on that? I have a question. You know, yeah. Um, with me and Teresa, I can't do a lot of things you talk about. But um, when I'm making a new pathway in the brain with that neuro taking advantage of neuroplasticity, then I notice that can can be difficult to breathe my normal breath. But I don't think that qualifies for what you're talking about because it's trying to make a new pathway in front of which is it's hard. hard. It's really hard. It is hard. Yeah. So there, I mean, are you talking about so the question was really for does it help about neuroplasticity and, and trying to create new pathways? And when you're doing things that's harder, especially if you have hemiparesis and you might breathe harder. So can you just give me an example of an activity that you're you're describing? Because I think this is a really important part and a point, and I'm so glad you asked this question. I can probably it left. But give me an example so I make sure we're on the same page. Well, uh, you know, one of the new exercises that they're having in June, you know, involves um, lifting a leg, 
this link up in the, um, on the, the affected side and peeking out a number of times. And, and, and as I'm doing that, then I can just feel myself getting shorter of breath and feeling the, the I get, I, whenever I'm doing something that I extra hard, I feel the pressure above my forehead, behind my eyes. And I, have, I don't know if it depends on what kind of stroke you have, but mine, um, what is that hemorrhagic? So, it, it, you know, I have low blood pressure. Also. It's not a blood pressure. It's, yeah. So, the kid here at home, so she was uh, commenting that when she does new exercises, such as lifting her leg or kicking out, and she's doing them repetitively, she uh, feels short of breath. So, I would tell you that you're doing exercises and you are in those zones if you're feeling short of breath. So, and you made a really good point, and I apologize for not breaking this down a little bit more. So, I talked about why walking and different things. But when you have a stroke and you have hemiparesis and maybe you're not walking or you're concentrating on doing a new exercise or what have you, again, you are training your brain and your muscles that you haven't worked in a while to do something new. And that is hard for your body. And so if you're really concentrating and doing this movement that you haven't done, it you are going to get short of breath. And that is an exercise. And so, yeah, you're getting your heart rate up and you're feeling like you know, oh my gosh, my heart's beating and I'm breathing hard. You're working, and that is exercise. Anything that gets our heart rate up above a really nice um, resting heart rate is an exercise. So thank you for pointing that out and asking that question. Because yes, you know, again, think about, I always think about um, if you've been down with, you know, the, the flu or a cold or you have allergies and you're doing activities you normally did or you're trying to return to them, you're short of breath earlier than what you were when you were doing all of those. So again, your body it needs to recover and build itself back up and any of those things are exercise. And again, if you're being physically active, let's say you're walking a pet or you're trying a new activity and, and you feel short of breath, all of those things are exercise. And so I don't want to discount that. I mean, again, if you you know, and again, if you park further away and you're able to walk or you're using a wheelchair and you decide to go in a park and stroll or you're like, you know what, I'm going to try to use my wheelchair in a store or around, around the home more, you're making yourself work harder and, um, and, uh, and yes, your heart rate is going to go up in, in your blood flow. So a few years back, I gave a little talk about um about recharging your brain, and I showed some data about how exercise increases your brain blood flow. So again, and that is good for your brain because if you think about the neurons and neuroplasticity, they need oxygen. And so when your heart rate increases, you're getting really good blood flow to those neurons and to your brain to really help you recover from a stroke. So all of these things are really good. And again, you know, anything from just sitting and being still, and again, at these low intensities, we did some studies and we prescribed exercise probably at this range to help blood flow go up from resting. When we went here, it went up even further. So again, when you're doing these activities, all of this is helping not just your heart, your lungs, your vessels, but also your brain as well, which is really important and something we don't talk about enough, I think, in stroke recovery in that role of exercise um, for the brain. So thank you for your question, Beth. Oh, you have a name, so I can, I can read. <laughs> All right, so um, th these are some pictures in uh, our lab and, uh, and everything. So, you know, we have some treadmills, we have bikes, but I use the new step a lot in our, our research just because of some of the things we do. Uh, it's it's uh, easy for us to, to measure some of the things we want to measure when we do stepper. Um, we have a study which I'm going to talk about um, that uses the harness and is um, high intensity interval training. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then, um, you know, again, if you're just doing activities that get your heart rate up, get you outside, um, and again, you can do that uh, in a seated device. And, you know, options for um, wheelchair users to to um, engage in exercise. Uh, any of these things are definitely uh, great for you to do. The only thing I do ask you is, if you choose to, um, you know, get your pet outside, you don't do that. <laughs> no, no sitting in your car taking your pet out for a run. You got it. You got it. Got to be in it. You got to be in it with the with the animals. 
So that is a long list. What's that? So that I have to stop. All right. So again, there there are other exercises that are beneficial. I, I think there's opportunities for again uh, weight training. Uh, you know, I when I was pregnant with my son, I was in a, in a really really bad accident, and I have always been very very active, and so. Um, it took me about two years to recover from that um, a long time ago, but I started with soup cans. Like, I was so, like, weak, and I just didn't have the strength I used to have. So coming out of there, I used soup cans. <laughs> you know, I had it in the house. Um, you know, I couldn't, I didn't go to a gym back then, and so I used soup cans and started, and then I forgot to, to wait. So again, anything you have for resistance um, is very helpful for building strength. Um, and, and also just know that for your legs, like it's really important to work your legs. So whether you're on uh, a seated stepper, you're doing something maybe in, you know, in your wheelchair where you're stepping, or if you're doing even just body squats like this is really good. If you can have somebody if you have impaired balance, maybe stand by you or go to a counter and try to do those. Um, the most important thing for getting out of bed and getting out of a chair is your leg strength. And so, you know, you need to get your leg strength up to use the, the toilet, do activities of daily living. So again, anything you can do to maintain that leg strength is really, really critical um, uh, for that. And again, I don't want to discount, you know, yoga and other, um, other opportunities, Tai Chi. Uh, there's a lot of benefit to that, especially for people with stroke or that have high blood pressure. Yoga, combining it with breathing techniques um, is really beneficial. We have some really interesting data, which I didn't even know that this was possible until we started looking at these data. But if you, like, we just use a Calm app, I think it's C-A-L-M. They have an app where you can like do a, a paced breathing where you follow the little ball around. Like when you do this and you breathe at six breaths per minute, like your blood pressure really changes, the blood flow to your brain really changes. And it's really interesting to see how that paced breathing just really slows everything down. And so again, for people that have high blood pressure, this is a really good activity to do. And so again, if you're doing yoga, breathing or Tai Chi and breathing, it is really, uh, you know, focusing on that control of breathing is also really good for, for people after stroke. So again, uh, there's a lot of different uh, ways that um, we can do that. I know KU Lawrence group has what they call functional exercise, and I think they have videos on YouTube for people who use wheelchairs to try to, um, and other people that have different various disabilities, they've created some videos online about what's called functional, functional exercise or functional fitness. But they have some videos that also kind of help get be creative with different exercise uh, interventions. So again, the lower extremity strength is really important for major muscle groups. So you can get your biceps and triceps or arms your leg strength, and again, any breathing that helps the diaphragm is, is all good, it's very good. For muscle strength, and we have even less data to know what to do with stroke and how it really helps recovery. Um, but we think, again, following just general guidelines and recommendations, two to three days uh, per week is something that you can incorporate it in there. You just wanna be careful that you don't overdo it or that you do too much back to back because you can, um, you know, get some muscle sores and get a slight. Yeah, we want to make sure you're getting getting rest in between your days. Um, just because we don't quite know, like for people who get muscle soreness, like that's not uncommon, but we don't know if that's really good for the immune pregnancy side. We just don't have data to say, yeah, it's it's okay. So just make sure you give yourself some rest. Don't you know, get out with big weights and 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 try to do a lot of things. But um, just think about that and and again. All of the exercises that are out there for strengthening, there's ways to, to modify it, going from a standing to a seated procedure again, or a position. So again, you don't have to stand. A lot of people do their arm pro standing. You can sit, you can lay in bed and do some. Like again, just you can modify it. I'm just thinking about being safe with your balance and posture. So again, you know, we can all, you know, you can squat, but again, if you have balance issues, use a counter or top or something like that, just to put your finger on there if you can or have somebody stand by you. 
for that for exercise. Let me do it on time. So I think there's these, you know, really great benefits after a stroke that I haven't talked about with exercise. And I think this is just to the general population. I, you know, I get grumpy when I'm in the house too much or at work too much. So exercise and getting outside has been shown to improve mood. We think that it improves cognition, but we don't know how yet. You know, we don't know if there's chemicals in the blood that that you know are created during exercise that help us think better. We don't know if it's just the outdoors and the fresh air. Um, it, it does help relieve uh, symptoms of depression, but certainly improve strength or upper extremity function. We do know we do have data to show that you know upper extremity exercise can improve the function. And I've been a really big advocate for overall vascular health and aerobic fitness. So if you can improve your fitness or your aerobic capacity, this has been really shown for secondary stroke prevention. It, in those first five years after stroke, you're, in the first two and five years, you're really at a high risk for stroke. And we need to do a better job of trying to advocate in our healthcare system for helping people become more active, help them understand what they can and, and, and can't do. And because again, we want to decrease um, uh, recurrent of, of stroke. And so I, um, for those that don't know, and I've said this on, on Twitter and I've talked to my colleagues, like if I, I can get cardiac rehab embedded in stroke care, I'm retired. Like that's my retirement. <laughs> I would really love to see that exercise because of all the therapies we have, and again, we don't have a lot to tell people who stroke, you know, what's the best thing for you. Exercise really comes out a lot of times as one of the top things that you can do. And I think it's really important that we move that forward. And I've got some colleagues on the East Coast that are trying to, um, they have some really great data on this showing secondary stroke prevention. And so they're going to Medicare and things like this. And, uh, CMS and trying to advocate for that. And so again, I know not everybody likes to exercise, but if we can get some in the healthcare system, I think it's really beneficial for that. And then you can increase your walking endurance. If you increase your fitness, reduce your blood pressure, we find that exercise can be very beneficial for increasing your walking endurance. So in, in summary, and this is just going to conclude this, we can apply that exercise that increases your heart rate and your breathing. So again, getting to that moderate intensity uh, is really best for your heart and brain health. But just because we tell people, okay, go out and exercise, get into that moderate zone, if you're not going to do it, it's of no benefit. So what's important is the exercise is the one that you are willing to do. And if that means, you know, going for a walk or doing whatever you like and you're being active, that's what's really important because you will improve your mood. You're going to enjoy doing it and you're going to stick with it. And that's really important. And really just sitting less throughout the day is, is really critical. I mean, I even try to my job as sedentary. And even though I exercise, the amount of time that I have to sit during the day, I try to get up and move around, go up the stairs or do different things. Because again, even though I exercise, if I sit all day, I kind of undo that. And so it's important to try to just be active throughout the day and sit uh, less often as you can. And if you're sitting for an hour, try to either get up, march in place, walk around the house, or do some activity that's really good. Any questions before I move on to the next session? Okay. So one of the things I want to talk a little bit about, because even though high intensity interval training is something that, you know, people have done, I mean, I, uh, like eons, like that. I mean, HIT has been around for a long time since so the Olympics started, I think. Um, but it's really just been talked about lately. And I think it's because you need less training time. And with these higher intensities, you can improve your VO2 max or your overall fitness, that aerobic fitness measure that we were talking about. But it's just been one of those things like, is it safe for people with cardiovascular disease or heart disease? And what they found is that. Um, they can get the same benefit in moderate intensity in 53% less time. So if you don't have a lot of time, it can really, you know, be a cost saving, but you can also see a better improvement in your overall fitness than with that moderate intensity. 
But we, we've had some questions like, is it safe for people post-stroke? And the reason we ask this question is, is because when you do high-intensity interval training, your heart rate's going up and down, your blood pressure is going up and down. And we wonder, like, is that safe for the vessels in the brain? And you talk about a hemorrhage stroke. I mean, that's, you know, a little bit different. Like, does that going up and down that and that continuous pattern, does that really affect, um, you know, is that good for the brain after stroke? And we don't have an answer for that quite yet. Um, and will people after stroke be able to do it and adhere to that? So why I'm thinking about hip for stroke recovery is that, you know, we know it's a leading cause of disability in the, in the world. Um, it may help with cardiovascular health, again, it's like secondary stroke prevention, and increase those growth factors for brain cells. And that's something that we were talking about, that Beth was talking about with neuroplasticity. So again, these are just showing the neurons and how they connect together for pathways, but on these uh, neurons are blood vessels. So again, we need good vascular health. And so we've seen that, um, again, for HIT, we can implement it with screening and it improves walking outcomes, and we know that it improves fitness. So when we think about high-intensity interval exercise, it's essentially repetitive switching. So you do a high-intensity bout, and then you have your recovery, and it can be just being slower, or it can be just like totally stopping. I will tell you on the treadmills, I'm not a big fan of just stopping and standing. I know some protocols do it, and um, they think that you're you're getting more rest to go into the next hit. I always worry about blood pressure and blood pooling, and the, you know, depending on how good the pressure is. But so far, it seems safe, so that that's good to know. But I prefer to do the passive. So again, you can do this interval duration. You can do very short bouts where you go really fast and then you, you really slow down and go really fast. Or you can do a four minute effort where you're keeping that high intensity for four minutes. And I always say, if you can do high intensity for four minutes, you are my hero. I get to two minutes and 50 seconds and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> so my personal preference is one minute intervals. I can do that. So again, this goes back to what am I willing to do? I'm not willing to do four minute and I'm just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. So, but I will do, and I have started incorporating these one minute intervals. And some of this was based on some of our data we've done in, in healthy people and in stroke. You see these blood pressure changes go up and down. And I do think that it's actually better for your vascular health and blood pressure control to, to do this in. So I started incorporating it in my exercise. Um, you can do low volume, which means your total exercise duration of these up, down, on, off um, intervals, less than 15 minutes, which I do a lot of like 12 to 15 minutes after a while, I, you know, I can't do it, I don't go that long. So again, I preference. And then high is greater than 15 minutes. So again, you can, uh, we can have people design those exercise interventions. But one of the studies that we just finished and published in JAMA Neurology, um, that's online and it's available for, for people um, to read. It was the University of Cincinnati was the primary site. KU uh, was another site in the University of Yale. So we did it on the treadmill. Uh, we were interested in for walking exercise with chronic stroke. What is the optimal walking training intensity? So again, it's that, how, how much should I do? What's that intensity? And so it, should it be in that moderate where I can talk and I can walk at the same time or I can sing and talk, but, or is vigorous where I'm working so hard I can't hold a tune or hold a conversation? So we wanted to ask these questions of like, well, what do we know when we think about these when we're designing our study? You know, are steps important? Do people need to get more steps in in their training intervention? Does that help? Um, is it speed? You know, is it how fast we walk people? Is that important for improving our walk? What about heart rate? Like, do we need to make sure people are getting into these heart rate zones to see better improvements in walking capacity? And is interval because it's really hard to do high intensity for 20 minutes. That's really hard. But if we did it this interval, is this better than continuous moderate intensity, which is the current recommendation? So we set out to answer these questions. 
And then we wanted to ask, what is the minimum training duration to maximize gains? And again, just keep in mind, this is for chronic stroke. So it might be different if you're in the hospital uh, in inpatient rehab, because you won't get for eight or 12 weeks. So this has to be either an outpatient therapy. So do we need four, eight, or 12 weeks? So that was the other thing. So we looked at intensity, how much, and we looked at the time it would take to see those uh, gains. So just to give you an idea of our protocol, so this is going to be a high volume hit protocol, right? So we're going to be greater than 15 minutes, but our intervals were started out for the first few minutes at 60 seconds, so 60 exercise, 60 reps, 60 exercise, 60 reps, then we went 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, so these were really fast intervals. And um, so we did a warm up. We would walk people over the ground in our hallway and our lab. We'd take you to the treadmill and then go through this hip protocol and then follow up with the over ground. And the idea was that if we could get you really fast on that treadmill in a safe harness and you felt like you could go super fast, that that would translate to then when we went out to the, to the whoops. I don't know what I did. There we go. Uh, intervention. So we looked at that, at that. And so what was important was making people walk at their fastest walking speed. Okay, that was the intervention. It was, we were looking at heart rate. Okay, so we could, we would keep you somewhere between 40 and 60% and of your, uh, your heart rate reserve here. Um, we would keep you here, but the, the really important piece was here how fast we could get you to walk during these trainings. And then moderate intensity, we, you could walk on the treadmill, uh, you know, fast, but you had to, we really kept you in this 40 to 60%. We didn't let you go above that. So if you were walking faster, we, you know, to have to slow you down to keep your heart rate in the cell. Um, and so that we can kind of test this. So what we did, we had people come in and we would screen you for a study after you consented. We would do some baseline testing to see if you qualified. And if you did, we would randomize you, which is just like the flip of a coin. It was either heads or tails. And, you know, just depended on that randomization, whether you were in hit or mad. And everything was the same. And then we would repeat our walking outcomes and our fitness measures. So what did we find? So again, with our, our walking, we did a 10 meter walk test. So again, we did your self-selected walking speed and your fastest walking speed. And then we did a six minute walk test to look at your walking endurance. We did an exercise test to look at your capacity. And then we haven't analyzed the stepping data yet um, to, to look at that um, exactly. So across all three sites, we randomized 55 people, 27 went into head and 27 went into neck. I'm just going to skip over this. So here's the results of the study. So again, I'm, I'll go ahead and explain this. So here's your first treatment session. Here's your 12. Here's after eight weeks, you're 24. And here's 36 after 12 weeks. So when I look at a percent of your baseline test, so again, we did your 10 meter walk test and said, okay, we want you to walk 10 meters. How fast can you walk? We looked at what percent during the, the, the training that you walked as a percentage of your peak um, training speed, your baseline. So again, you have to remember in the math group, we, we would be, you know, we had to kind of blunt you according to your heart rate. But what we would see is that um, in, in here, it took about 12 weeks for you to really be at 100% of your walking speed and you increase that. Because we are pushing people in the hit group, uh, for their fastest speed, they actually reached levels of 200% of their walking speed on, on again, 10 meter walk fast. So training people to walk fast really helped them in their, um, in their short distance walking. And so I just wanna highlight, this is the treadmill. So you can see how we were making people walk faster on that treadmill and really pushing people to, to walk. Um, but we see that it also carried over to the overground, although not as much, but, uh, you know, again, we didn't have people in the harness on the overground. So when we looked at the six-minute walk test, which was our primary outcome measure, when people started to exercise, 
Yes, I think again, it, it looks like these are different, but the difference between 180 and 200 under 200 meters isn't, isn't much. So there is no difference here in baseline between the groups. At four weeks on the six minute walk test, you can kind of see that the hit group starts to, looks like they're starting to improve more, but it wasn't statistically significant. What we see at eight weeks is that the hit group really pulled apart on their um, walking distance and then at 12 weeks. So we were hoping to see differences at, at four weeks, but it looks like 12 weeks is the optimal dose to see an improvement in your six minute walk test. So uh, again, the hit group was the, had the better outcome. So this is a, a lot of like numbers and data. So I'm just gonna break this apart for you. So when we think about how you normally walk, just how you feel like you're comfortable walking after the <laughs> exercise training, what we saw in that group at four weeks didn't change a whole lot in how they, how they felt comfortable just walking. But the hip group really increased uh, after four weeks of training. We don't really see a big difference here statistically, but you can see that there is a difference in their, their walking speed. And by 12 weeks, people got really comfortable with that fast walking. And so when we do the testing, they actually walk uh, faster, their self-selected gait speed. And then you can see when we ask them to walk at their fastest pace, the group that's practicing this fast walking can do a much faster pace. And again, we're not really holding on or helping them at this point. It's how fast can you go just walking if we walk beside you? And so again, it's picking up that, that, that speed. So again, there is some benefit to high intensity interval training on a treadmill and over ground for improving your walking uh, distance and your walking speed. Now I'm really interested in the stepper, um, you know, like does that translate? Because again, there's not a lot of people have access any in anywhere really um, in their homes with a treadmill with a harness to do this at home. But there are places like the Stroke Foundation and community centers where new steps are available. And so we're hoping to start a study here um, by May or June where we're going to try to implement like high intensity interval training on a stepper to see if we can improve walking outcomes and other measures of brain health and blood pressure. So the take home message for this is that I, I think it's important, you know, even though I've talked about like what in that when you do fancy statistics, what's better, but I think it's important to understand that both groups improved from their baseline. Both groups got better in their walking, both groups got better in fitness, although I didn't show it. They both improved. It's just when you practice that fast walking, you're going to be better at walking up. So I don't want to give the message that moderate intensity is not good for you. It is. It's better than baseline. It's just hit. It's a little bit better for the outcomes. Um, and we need at least 12 weeks um, to maximize gain. So we have looked at some of the data and what do we know now? So the steps that you took, so the hit group actually had less steps because we would walk really fast, but then we would have you stop and rest. And then walk really fast stop and rest where the moderate intensity group in their training had way more steps and so for the walking outcomes steps didn't matter um, in that speed matter you know we looked at the data how fast if you're in the hit group and the speed which makes sense but speed matter heart rate was not an important variable in that so even getting people in the heart rate zones that didn't matter as much as the speed and then again, for us, it's the interval versus continuous. And again, the, those in the interval group uh, benefited, but it's a direct relationship to the speed at which they were walk. So in summary, um, exercise is great for the heart, lungs, and brain after stroke. I think exercise is a powerful medication. It improves everything on this list. Um, you know, I think there's some real benefits and we're really trying to figure out for people post-stroke, you know, which is the, the best medicine. So again, um, if anyone's interested, you can either reach out or Sarah can give my contact information. So for this hit stroke trial, we think we're going to get refunded to do the same trial, but then look and see if people maintain their gains three months after stroke. So if you think this is something that you're interested in when we start recruiting, we could, I don't know if you could take my flyers, but maybe not. Um, 
Um, but if you're you're interested, we will put stuff out in the news and things like that if people are interested in it or know people. And then we'll be doing some work on on the step or and things like that. So we're really very motivated at trying to figure out how do we improve the health of people post from um, in our community here in Kansas City. So with that. Uh, I'd just like to thank your team and the American Stroke Foundation for the invitation to, to present today and all the funding that um, uh, that we we get um, that really helps support it. So for our stroke trial, we you know somebody in the community donated two hundred thousand dollars so that we could donate and we could do this trial. And, and so again, this is all just critical to our success of answering our questions. So any questions for for free?